Okay, we're going to get started. Wow, another great crowd for a uh, Sunday afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Jack Santos. I'm on the board here at the uh, museum, uh, at the Kesselhaus Maritime Museum. And just a couple of notes about what we're doing here, what's happening. Uh, here is some water on a little table over there, complimentary, help yourself. Of course, there's the donation bucket. Uh, for those of you, you know, like I guess like Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind, we're always dependent on the kindness of strangers. So uh, that's uh, always there for uh, folks. And even more importantly, there is our membership forms with a little QR code on them. We encourage everybody to be a member. You know, memberships account for maybe 10 to 20 percent of the budget uh, here at the museum. But more, you know, what's very important is it, it gives. Uh, funders and, and uh, donors a sign of how important this is to the community. So we really uh, we really hope you be a member if you're not a member and, and join us. The uh, things that we're doing this year, just to kind of recap really quickly, if you're not going to be around for July 4th week, I would rethink your plans. That's a uh, Maritime Days week here at the museum and there's going to be a lot going on. Uh, we can't announce all the details yet. It's coming, but uh, we'll just take it from me. Hang around. Most of the reporters get out of town July 4th. You might want to stay in town this July 4th for our, merit, our annual Maritime Days. Uh, we've got four, three more of these after this one. Alice Gould and I will do next week's warm talks. And how prophetic was that? You know, when you're in the middle of summer, you ask yourself, is it really going to be cold in January? <laughs> yeah, it's cold in January. So it's, uh, Alice Gould will be talking about Caleb Cushing, and it will be a little bit different. It will be in an interview format, a style, with a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, Bethany Groft Row, the week after, it will be talking about the role of women in the woman's sculpture. That's in our legendary Newbury Reporters exhibit. And Jay Williamson will cap off this lecture series uh, this winter with a uh, a uh, talk, uh, a discussion of Tristan Dalton, and he's got a very unique view of Tristan's life and the Dalton family here in Newburyport that uh, I know I'm looking forward to hearing what he says about that. Other plans we've got here at the Custom House this year, uh, we have two more legends in the making, uh, and uh, we'll see those unveiled in April, and then again during Yankee Homecoming, uh, when Jeffrey Briggs will actually be making that final one on the lawn during the week of Yankee Homecoming. Uh, so uh, you know, stay tuned for more about the two more statues that are going to be added to the exhibit. We'll have our usual music on the lawn during August, so I look forward to that too. So there's a lot going on here at, at the Museum. Maritime Days, Yankee Homecoming, more statues for the exhibit than, than, uh, and music in the summer. Uh, so with that, let me kind of introduce uh, Timothy Palmer. Oh, no, wait a minute, that's Timothy Palmer. You're Bob Watts, and for those of you that... have similar hairstyles. <laughs> for those of you that don't know Bob, you may have seen him walking around the streets of, of Newberry Court. Uh, back in the old days, that would have been that totally, something totally different, not much more civilized. And uh, he, he's usually walking around town with a Nikon camera around his neck, and sometimes he's even on his blue e-bike, uh, when, hopefully when the warm, warmer weather comes around. He has regular posts on Facebook. We're live streaming this now on Facebook, and we'll have a recording of it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you, if you see his Facebook post, you'll know that he kind of uh, phrases that with, come for a walk with me. Bob is retired. He's been retired for two years. Uh, from a 37-year career with Nikon cameras as their New England account manager, he was responsible for all of New England except Connecticut. They're not part of New England, anyways. <laughs> and for a period of uh, all of upstate New York, he's well traveled in the area. And he's uh, many times he's off the beaten path, and he's always using his camera. Uh, every now, and he's now in that life phase that many of us are that we describe as every day is Saturday. <laughs> or even, or what day is it? <laughs> uh, currently, he's in his second term at the board of directors of uh, the Museum of Old Newberry, and he actively photographs for them 
uh, for both current and uh, for archival uh, purposes. Uh, he has a 20, he's been a 20 year member and he's now the vice president of the National Society for Preservation of Covered Bridges, which is apropos for Timothy Palmer. And, uh, and that, uh, that's a society that's also a nonprofit, 501c3, founded in 1954. And in New Hampshire, they have a large archive of all the covered bridges they published. I uh, have a copy, the World Guide to Covered Bridges. Bob loves the city. He's got to tell you why. He's got to tell us all about Timothy Palmer. Bob uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a it's a true pleasure and honor to be here. Um, it's uh, for several ways. Um, one is Palmer is very fascinating to me. Um, Jeffrey Briggs has done a tremendous show here. We'll be talking a bit about that. And, and when Jack asks, one responds. So uh, that's why I'm here and I'm happy. Thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. It's uh, um, really a treat to have you all here. So um, I'm just going to wave hi to the to the people that might be live out there, because there, there are out there, it's, a, it's that other nether world or whatever that's somewhere up in the cloud. Where is that cloud? That's what I want to know. So, um, so anyway, um, Timothy Palmer, a legendary Newbury Porter, and um, we're going to talk about him and bridges in general, um, covered bridges in general, and um, I hope you enjoy. So. Um, I, I'm going to use a word that's kind of popular nowadays, infrastructure. Some look at infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is a big deal. Um, it's probably one of the major concepts of a, a, a new colony's uh, beginnings and survival and, and moving forward. Um, you got to have your roads, you got to have your bridges. Um, and if you can sort of take yourself back in time, the first landing, I call it the or Plymouth Rock or whatever down in Newbury, the, the rock there, 1630, the first people coming up into this area. Um, and Newbury establishing itself, and then Newbury Port and West Newbury. Um, there's always been need to move and travel, um, and if you can believe it, there was never a bridge across this river until 1790. Bridge concept to go across the river. Um, a little bit of an impediment, but of course things work themselves out. So I, I started, this is not a new report, but I just started because it's a lovely little stream that I know. And I just wanted to show you probably one of the most very special plays. Um, I'm going to give two comparisons. So for um, the, the Christians, um, Bethlehem is a really special place, the birthplace of Jesus. For Jerusalem, it's very special to the Jews, for the beginnings of their religion. If you were a Mormon, um, this spot in Randolph is very special because it's the birthplace of Joseph Smith, and he was the, the father of, of um, the Mormon religion. And they, they treat it as almost like a shrine, but they protect. There's, a, there's an old ancient road, a north-south road that went through Vermont um, in the late 1600s, and they protected it. And they, I can't believe it. They actually let you drive down and onto it. There's stone walls on the side. Um, and then when you approach this little simple bridge, they do divert you around it because they don't want you driving over that. But I, I just, I found that sometimes the simple and most basic things are, can be really fascinating. Those three big rocks there have been carrying wagons across it for over 300 years. So, just a little bit of history of me. I grew up on a, my grandfather's farm. It was north of New York City. Um, we had eight fields and you hit some woods. And when you're a kid, and back in the early 50s or late 50s, you know, we could go wherever we wanted, kind of, on, on the farm, you know. And we'd go to the back and there was a stream. So when you're five, six, seven years old, stream's about as far as you go. I don't remember exactly the details, these are not original pictures, but somewhere either a tree fell down, or we may have cut it down, a tree fell down and fell across the stream. 
that little simple action, plus maybe we put a few boards, maybe just use um, uh, tall sticks, we could walk across that little bridge and then we could go to town. And there was the Andrews Five and Dime that had the bubble gum and the baseball cards and the pea shooters and all those good things that kids yearn for. And then last in my personal um, history is this is an actual picture of my mother taking me to a covered bridge somewhere. I believe it's in Pennsylvania. She liked um, she liked the Amish area. And um, so I, I imagine I'm about five years old there. And isn't this interesting? This is some of the technology that's out there because the, the background picture, the one up on the top left, is the original picture that we have. Um, but with special scanning software today, it can, it can restore ROC, R-O-C, restore original color. So all of a sudden, instead of a faded, almost disappearing photograph, I can just click a, a button and the software fixes the picture. Pretty remarkable as far as I'm concerned. So here's Timothy Palmer. He's a Newburyport resident. He's a bridge builder. He's believed he lived on the north side of Federal Street, uh, near High Street. There's a yellow house there. That's where they believe he lived. Um, Sharon from the library has done a little research on me. It's hard to pinpoint it down. I, it looks like probably he didn't own it, but we're not sure. Um, and this is the best and only representation of Mr. Palmer. Um, this is a property of the Museum of Old Newbury. Um, I gave Bethany a little assignment a few days ago, um, but I didn't hear back. This, this was done by a very sophisticated um, device that came over from France. The, the person who wanted, they were all profiles, the person that wanted it sat there, and some kind of device moved down the profile of the face and then transmitted it, not, not electronically, but mechanically, to a pencil that was on the, the board. It's funny that the backgrounds are all pink. Um, I actually uh, went to the Sleeper Boatport House in Gloucester. And at the end of the tour, we were taking our booties off, the, the director or the lady giving us a tour. Um, there's one of these there, not, not a Palmer, but another one with the pink background, and I recognize it right away. And she goes, ooh, she goes, if they have a dis every historic New England uh, property has a disaster plan. If, if something was happening that was an immediate emergency disaster, everybody who works in the facility or the property knows the top 10 things to take out of the property. Maybe it's a fire and they, they know where to go and to get the top, and she points, she says, that's one of the top 10 pieces. So I don't know if it's because of the process per se or the person, but um, it's, a, it's a very interesting. But it was very significant for Jeffrey to be able to get a really clear visual appearance of what he looked like. Of course, this is well before photography. So in his youth and after the war, the Revolutionary War, um, Palmer apprenticed with well-known architects and millwrights, Daniel and Moody Spofford. He designed the Rocky Hill Meeting House in 1785, having learned from them about truss systems to support ceilings and roofs. Um, you know, in, a, in these meeting houses and in a lot of churches, you don't see a beam in the middle of the, the room hold, you know, to help hold up the, the, the roof of this large space. Um, they're using truss systems to hold the roof up or the ceiling, depending on, you know, probably both parts of that. So um, that's where he learned about the concept of trusses to be able to support things. Um, he was recognized as a well-known artisan of the day. I'm going to have a little bit bigger picture of this one, but this was another key image that's also owned by the Museum of Old Newbury um, and was an important part for Jeffrey. Um, uh, Palmer designed and built these first of their kind bridges, meaning there had been bridges, and I can show you a picture later on. There had been bridges, kind of like what I talked about as a kid, you know, where they just put a, drop a tree across a, a stream, maybe two of them, then nail boards or something, but um, this is the first of the kind to be able to have to span 160 feet. 
Um, there's no trees that were 160 feet high um, to be able to span that and by using a truss system. So um, it's the first of the kind in the colonies. It's um, two arched truss bridges in 1792 with Deer Isle in the middle. So when you're looking at the image there, the left end of the north end, which is the Salisbury end, was a one arch truss. It had a double roadway, meaning they could come and they could go. Um, and um, it, a double, and it was probably covered about 1810. So it was built in 1792, but not covered right away. Um, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, these bridges are funded by uh, uh, investors, and um, sometimes investors get a little cheap when it gets down to the should we spend another thousand dollars or whatever to put a roof over. Um, so initially it was not designed and it was an open trust system. Um, and then um, uh, two, uh, then it had a draw, two open king post spans, which are the part on the left. Um, the right in the south end, which is the Newbury Port end, was a single span truss with a high arch. Um, and he actually was reading um, architectural writings from Palladio, an Italian architect that went back into the 1500s that talked about arches. Um, and um, so he built it with a high arch. It was replaced in 1810 by the chain suspension bridge, which unfortunately collapsed in 1827. There were a couple oxen lost and um, the, the drivers were, were okay and, and a couple horses were okay. Um, it was immediately rebuilt again as a, a trust arch bridge, um, and it was a toll bridge until 1868. I'm sorry, when it was immediately rebuilt, it was rebuilt as a suspension bridge. Bridge. It's actually one of the only suspension bridges that the state maintained. This is a little bit bigger picture, and the contrast has been boosted up a little bit, so you can um, you can feel the Deer Island, and you can see the, the, the trusses on both sides, um, and um, this was important. This was um, the, the beginnings of um, the, the first to be able to cross the Merrimack on a bridge. And this is, I alluded to in my post, um, it was a disruptive technology. I like that kind of phrase. We hear that a lot today. Of course, me in the camera industry, it was all around the, the cell phones. Um, there's always been a lot of types of things called disruptive technology. There's a little hint there, you could read it on the bottom. Um, what, it, what did it disrupt? And I gave you a little hint earlier too that from um, 1630 to 1790, that 160 years, people had to get across the river. So how did they do it? Somebody knows. The ferries. The ferries. Yeah. yeah, and this is a little etching. It says Newbury Port and the Salisbury Ferry. It looks like it's down sort of um, right here in the downtown. There's another one over at Jefferson Street at the bottom of that. That's really curious to go look at. You're looking across to Carr's Island, and you can see the wharf, the stone wharf on Carr's Island. So they left from the bottom of Jefferson Street, and you can see the remains of the wharf. Then they crossed over Carr's Island, and Mr. Carr had... Um, he actually had a floating bridge at one point in time to, or other ferries to take it from cars over to Salzburg. So that was the disruptive technology part. Frankly, it was, um, I'm going to use a word here, it, it, they were pissed at a lot of these, uh, these uh, ferrymen. You know, they're losing their livelihood. This bridge goes in, they're, they're, out, of, they're out of work. So um, there were some articles I remember years ago finding with, Sharon on the 50th anniversary of the bridge, and it was written in the Daily News that there have been um, protests and strong words when when the bridges went in. Um, but that's um, that was my little fun statement of it was a disruptive technology. And again, this is that beautiful print that resides at the um, Museum of Old Newbury. So on May 30th, 1791, 45 investors petitioned the court to allow them to build a set of bridges connecting Newburyport to Deer Island and then Deer Island on to Salisbury, also to include the right to collect tolls, and it appears also the right to build a tavern. 
on Deer Island. That's a, an important concept. Profit-wise, it's wonderful. The General Court of Massachusetts granted a charter on January 9, 1792, and the bridge was completed on November 26, 1792. Talk about putting the pedal to the metal and working hard. They built this whole bridge system in, in less than a year. Um, uh, the two bridges contain 6,000 tons of timber, um, and pretty massive. Cost to build, even back then, was $36,000. That's a lot of money. It was not coming from the public coffers. Again, there was a corporation and investors that, these 45 investors that ponied up the money. Um, the tolls initially came in annually at about $4,000 a year, um, which would have taken you know almost 10 years to uh, recoup, but the tolls collected over its life were $302,000. Um, and in 1868, the bridges were purchased from the shareholders by the state for $30,000. Um, keep in mind, though, that they um, they replaced the, the, the arch on the, the right there. They replaced it with a suspension bridge. The suspension bridge fell down. They had to rebuild the suspension bridge. Then they covered the one on the other side. They had to put in... Um, the, uh, you know, uh, ability to raise the, the bridge up for ships to come through. I didn't include it here, but I got to tell you, there was a lot of, even back then, there was a lot of politics going on. <laughs> there were people that didn't want it. It went all the way up to Haverhill that they didn't want it. They felt that the piers that they were putting in was going to impede the water flow going up and down. This was, you know, the, the people were grumping at that time because they were thinking there was going to have to be. Um, piers like every 15 feet or so to support just like tree trunks across it. They didn't realize that what he was going to build was a, a continuous arch that would be fairly wide open. Um, but it, I just I was tickled about the fact, um, in fact there was there was negative comments about the whole thing, but um, the, the, the court said go ahead with it because they kind of recognized that he had a plan and then it really was important for the growth of the of the community and the general area. Oh, and then then so after it opens there and um, there on um, it opened on November 26, 1792. And I'm taking a quote. You're going to see um, some pictures of it. this. Is the Covered Bridge Topics magazine, and it's from July of 1961. And I'm just going to read you a little paragraph from it that talks about this. Now, most of us who are local folks are going to know um, about Timothy Dexter. He was a little bit of a character. Um, you might know his big house was up on High Street and every every pedestal on the large fence around it had figurines on it. And He wrote a book about pickles. And, and But anyway, he was... So, a dinner and celebration in honor of this piece of engineering took place July 4th 1793, in a tavern erected by the corporation on the island. Again, that's a moneymaker. It is said that the eccentric Timothy Dexter, who was one of the first shareholders, stood on the table and made a speech worthy of the occasion. The Essex Journal, a newspaper, says that he delivered an oration on the bridge, which for elegance of style, propriety of speech, or force of argument, was truly Ciceronian. Cicero. The report must have written this with tongue in cheek because Decker's oration could hardly be understood. And although he later explained that he was talking in French, it seemed rather more likely that he had succumbed to the joys of the evening. So, I, I found that as a kind of a humorous, uh, you know, nothing like a little fear of what they could do to you. So they had a they had a celebration because it was a major event to happen. So this is the first bridge crossing. Um, the Merrimack, 1792, covered later, um, about 10 years later, replaced about 1875. And this is an early etching after of the chain link. And you can see after the chain link bridge is there, you can see the chain link kind of off to the left side. It's a, I like the, and then this one is a, a, a sketch um, interpretation of the view. And it kind of gives you a, a, a feel of what was there. 
And these are actually some early photographs. Um, um, we're blessed in this city to have some of the earliest photographs. In fact, the, the Museum of Old Newbury has what are considered some of the first photographs made in the United States. Um, 1839, the first camera that came over from France, a daguerreotype. But we're blessed that we have some photographic evidence of things. Um, not sure exactly what the, the year is on these, but you can see. Um, so the one on the left is the view from Salisbury um, looking across, and you're seeing um, Deer Island. You're seeing that tavern there. may not have been a tavern at that point. Um, and then the other one shows some of the chains. This is another one of this remarkable technology. I believe Kristen at the museum did this, found this for me. Um, and um, you can take black and white photographs and they can become colorized. It's a little subtle here, but you can see hints of uh, color being introduced into the file. Um, she did one of my mother, which was, is a treasure to me. And it's amazing, again, what some of these new technologies can give us. So again, um, this is a, the top picture is a view from the Salisbury side. You can see the tavern in the background on the right. Um, you can see part of the drawbridge um, to be able to allow the taller ships to be able to go through. Oh, you know, that's the one I'm going to, back, I'm backtracking. Can you see, sometimes the, the ships would have masts that they could, that were on hinges so they could drop the masts down um, to be able to give them clearance through a lower bridge like that. And the bottom one is um, a, a view, again, from the, this is from the Newburyport side showing the approach to, I'm sorry, no, this is from the Salisbury side also, showing the two roadways for the coming and going concept, uh, double barrels, recall. So here we go. My first meeting was April 23rd, 2021, with Mr. Jeffrey Briggs. He's the artist who has created these magnificent maquettes that are in the other room. This extraordinary show is called Legendary Newberry Porters. Um, this not too thick, but full of a lot of detail. Book could give you some of the most significant history of some of the most significant um, individuals here in this community. Um, and it's available here at the um, museum and it's, it's a great reference piece to have. So when I first went to see Jeffrey, he was um, actually spent quite a bit of time on the bridge, the concept of the bridge and the trusses. And he was using that earlier photograph as part of his design um, uh, information. And the, um, it was really, I, I love seeing where artists work, where they create, where they live, where their studios might be, where maybe they, you know, a site that they went to paint. Um, all those kind of things just really tickled me a lot. So it was a real honor in my respect to be able to go and work with <laughs> Jeffrey and see him in his studio. And, um, and he even left his good old regular shirt on for me. <laughs> um, so, so here um, again is a picture of uh, the little bridge that he made out of um, wood materials and silver painted and this was going to become part of the, um, the maquette or the original sculpture piece. You can see in the background he has that, um, that uh, profile picture and he came up with some sketches. He wanted to be on a workbench. Um, and then you can see here as we're progressing, the, um, the clay statue is um, coming together and the hands are being um, appropriately placed. And, um, meeting up with the workbench and the, um, him observing his model. It all followed then with um, molds and other molds <coughs> and pouring and a positive to a neg or negative to a positive and all of a sudden the, the casting is done and the final uh, maquette is shown. Um, which was just, a, again, that was about four sessions. I think that went from April, May, June. It was at least a three-month period um, until we reached the final piece. It's beautiful. We're showing it, of course, in the, the next room, and this is the one where um, the Palmers, where we're highlighting the process. You can see a video there about the process and Jeffrey speaking about the process, and you can see the actual molds there. Um, so that's all part of it. 
the show next door. So I just wanted to give you, this was, um, I, this is where I read that piece about the party at the tavern. Um, this is the Covered Bridge Topics, and it's, it's um, part of the, the National Society that I'm part of, and it's July of 1961. It's, um, it was pretty fascinating to me. This is a listing of the bridges that, um, the top ten are the ones that he worked on and designed and built directly. Um, they start at the top, and if you look at the first date, that's the date of building. So the Newburyport one here is 1792. Um, then we go 17. Then he got pretty. He was cranking, and set up in Andover 1793, in Portsmouth 1794, Haverhill um, 1794 also, um, and Rocks Village, which um, now is steel and has just gone through a restoration. I know um, that's 1795. 1796, he built two more down in uh, Georgetown, District Columbia area, and um, White River uh, up in Vermont, and worked with the design on the Windsor Cornish Bridge at Augusta, and then Philadelphia, 1805-1806. These are really important ones, especially to the covered bridge realm, because these all these other ones would have initially been built as just trust bridges, and then they figured out to cover them later because these investors finally got the got it together that if you put a roof over a bridge and put some siding on it, the bridge can last for hundreds of years. If you were to leave it all wide open, imagine your house or even this place without a roof on it and rain, what do you expect will happen? Snow, you know, you'll, you'll have degradation and rot happening. So that simple process of putting a roof over your head um, really extends the life of them. And then from 1806, 1821, he also had significant um, work on bridges all over the area, too. So this was the first one. He, um, he went up the, up the river a little bit. I love that spot. I assume you all know it, Rocks Village Bridge, 1795, designed and built by Palmer. It was rebuilt in 1828, mid-1850. Some stereo views show that a draw span was added 1896, two steel spans and a rotating draw span was added, um, and it replaced the earlier ones. And then June 14, 1903, a 21-foot freshet. Can you imagine the river being 21 feet higher than normal came down through, and it totally washed it all away. So they had to rebuild it, and at that point in time, in the early 1900s, steel was becoming more. This one's on the, the Rocks Village side. You can see the little building where the um, fire engine is, is kept, and you can see the, the toll house is up under a tree there. Um, I, I like that view. I love postcards, colored postcards, too. Um, and the other one is the view from this side, the, the West Newbury side. Then he goes a little further up, um, 1794, the Haverhill Bridge. Initially it had three open trusses. These are just open, these are common to, even today for, we call them pony trusses today, where um, no, not putting a roof over it, the railroad bridges um, today, still they still use wood, wooden pony trusses. It does appear in the etching that they did cover the, tr the truss itself. They didn't put a roof over it, but by covering the truss itself, they were protecting that important part of it. Um, so it was rebuilt in 1808 with four spans and a draw span, and then it was covered in 1825. We have now some photographs of it, too. Um, 1825 raised in 1873. You can see this again was double barrel. One. Double barrel ones were more expensive, of course, um, but they were much more efficient because you could have a coming and going lane. Up north we see a few of those, um, but they're, they're usually quite the rarity. And these are a few stereographs of the bridge. Um, again, um, these are curious. You, you probably all look through those devices and all of a sudden it's the, everything's three-dimensional and you, you know, you feel like you're there. What's the, what are you know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's cool. So here we're moving to a bridge um, that was 
um, that he built. He moved down to uh, Philadelphia area. Philadelphia area was desperate. They wanted. They had only had a floating bridge that didn't work well in the winter time. In fact, they always had to pull it up in the winter time to be able to um, to uh, uh, protect it so it wouldn't be ripped up by the ice flows and stuff like this. Um, so it wasn't an afterthought thing. It was all part of the design. Um, built in 1805, replaced in 1850. Um, another good view of it. So imagine some of these costs. You know, the first one here, 39,000. Believe me, they all went up after that um, into the 50, 60,000 range. But you could go across the bridge for a penny if you were just walking. So I guess it took a lot of a lot of crossings to bring back that $300,000 that ultimately the, the one down here at Deer Island earned. And this one I find uh, William Strickland's painting of the bridge. It's a romantic, beautiful looking covered bridge. Um, it, it, it was a big deal for Philadelphia. This was their first um, bridge crossing um, for the city. Then he went a little bit further up the river. Um, this is Delaware River, and he went up to um, Easton, Pennsylvania, and they crossed over to Phillipsburg, New Jersey. This was built in 1805 and 1806, and replaced in 1895 with a new structure. But again, you can give a little size. You can see some of the people in the bottom there. You can get a little size. This was a quite a massive structure there. Um, ultimately, some uh, trolley tracks were laid through it also. Um, and they um, describe the fact that uh, the bridge endured many floods and storms where other bridges would have fallen. Um, this one remained in place from 1806 to 1895. Kind of a nice view of it at the bottom there, a romanticized engraving of it up there. So he was quite prolific in about 10 years um, he then came back to Newburyport, and he had been like the surveyor of the roads for this for the city, and they were right at a point in the early 1800s where they needed direction. He was involved with the mall um, design and um, just how the roads would all work and be laid out for a lot of the city. He was still quite involved in, in that aspect of it. Um, there's also a description of him being involved in the, the design of the uh, Unitarian Church on Pleasant Street. They cannot find it in writing, um, but he was all part of that group that would have been um, pretty influential in that aspect. And of course, he did pass away, and I just wanted to show you, um, if you're over at the, the, the mall and um, and you look across towards the cemetery, there's a, a double, there's a gate there, and it's noting some of the distinguished people who are buried there, and Mr. Palmer is in here. And I made kind of a, a little note about it. Um, this lower corner here, just above Pond Street, is the Memorial Cemetery part, where uh, for all the, uh, the soldiers and stuff, all the flags sometimes. So that's in that bottom corner. As you kind of go up Auburn Street, you'll see some big, tall, white birches. They're beautiful. And then up above them, kind of on a little bit of a ridge, I'll call it, or if you're going up the hill, right about where that circle is, is, is two gravestones. Um, in memory of Mr. Timothy Palmer, who died December 19th, 1821, at the age of 70. So one of our distinguished new reporters, again, uh, infrastructure is so important to the development of a, of a, a country, a state, a city, um, and he was one of the more important characters to start to build bridges for us. From here I'm going to show you a little bit of the process, and I, I kind of need to honor, it was, I was an honor to be invited to join in for an early preview of Jeffrey Briggs' project. Um, this was before the museum here, Custom House, had agreed to um, to put this show on. It was I, I, I was there with, the, and I have the highest respects for Skip and Marge Motes um, and Lindley Briggs, his lovely wife, and then Dave Mack, and you can see them all here in the bottom. That was one of our 
first meetings. And then, then I was asked to consult with Jeffrey and Timothy Palmer. It was a real thrill for me. And then the show opened April 1st, 2022. It runs through the end of this calendar year. So um, if you haven't seen it or tell your friends, tell your neighbors, um, it, it's this is probably the most significant show of art in the city this past year or so. So we had all kinds of guests. They were all people who wrote for the book, um, the book that we have here. Um, Many people cons who consulted um, helped write the book, too. And there's Jack. And then a few more folks. And it was just a, like I say, it was a, a wonderful day when this show opened. And here I just want to reference some credits. Um, the Amesbury Carriage Museum. Uh, Mike Harland has written um, quite a piece on Timothy Palmer and his bridges. Um, there's another one by a gentleman named Frank Griggs, who is a very detailed, 135 pages. It gets into extreme detail. Um, and then um, this is called the, the uh, Cover Bridges of Yesteryear. Um, it's a, dot, a lostbridges.org. This is a site by the president of the Covered Bridge Society, um, and it, it um, has listings of virtually every bridge in America even the ones that were, are lost. Um, so it's, it's a terrific, um, terrific reference site. So I want to thank you all, one and all, for attending. Um, I want to thank Jeffrey and Lindley. They are the, 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 the creators of the, this show out here, of the Custom House Maritime Museum, and, and Jack Santos for his um, involvement. Um, and then I can say, We've been here 36 minutes. Do you want to see some more? I have about 10 minutes of covered bridges of New England. Would that be of interest? I'm, so, so. I'm not seeing anybody say no. So I'm going to take you on a little tour around some of my favorite bridges in New England. And sometimes I like to, this is a lovely picture by a woman named Peggy McDaniel. Um, I, I love the, you know, just follow the light. Just go towards the light. Um, it was an extraordinary image that she created there, uh, light streaming into a portal. Um, and this is a map of all of New England. All those little dots are covered bridges. Um, do you know where the most of them are? Which state might have the most? No. Um, I heard somebody else here. Is it? No. No, um, Vermont has about 104, New Hampshire has about 54, Maine has about 8, Massachusetts has about 10, but Pennsylvania has more than all of them. Well, that's all that's of them. Not on the maps. <laughs> they have 252, I believe. And then Indiana and Ohio have very high numbers of bridges. Um, so, um, Yes, Vermont has the most in New England, New Hampshire's second, um, but there are a few other states that have even more. They go all the way out to um, Washington State and Oregon, a few in California. There's not too much, nothing really in the southwest. Um, there is one in Alabama. We're having a safari, we call it a covered bridge safari. It's all us sneaky people. Um, we're having one, there's some in Georgia, there's about 12 in Georgia. Um, one of them is over in Alabama, though. So, and this is, again, a blow-up of just New Hampshire and a little bit of Maine and Vermont. They're showing the density of them. They are quite dense. So, I, um, I, so I covered all this area for, for Nikon, and, um, it was a great job. I had every camera they made in my trunk, and probably 30 lenses in my trunk. And I figured they didn't really own me until like 8 o'clock in the morning and 5.30 at night. And so I would get up early, I'd be out on the road, I'd get up early and I'd, or I'd, I'd wander around looking for the... the um, they're off the beaten path a lot of times. I, I can sometimes call it like adult hide and seek. Um, they're out there, you've got to go find them though. They're not sitting on the interstates. Well, there's a few right next to some interstates. 
Um, but you've got to go find them, and half the time I find things, other things that are even more interesting to me. Where is the bridge that's on the way to Gloucester? In the lower right hand corner, there's a. Where is that one located? That's a good question. I'm not sure if I know of one around here. Looks like Essex, sort of. Let me cogitate on that a little bit. Okay. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't have that answer. This slide came from Bill, our president, I will say. So I, this one I want to mention, too, because it's just kind of curious. Remember I talked about the old concept of a, a log, you know, a tree falling across a river? This is the only um, surviving covered bridge of that. It's up in the flume up in New Hampshire there. Um, it, it's, it, it is a log that fell across the ravine. And they just went and put some boards down and put some sides up to hold the roof up. Um, so this is the only one that's, a, that's that kind of a concept um, to be able to see um, just a, a, a single log across the ravine. This one's a little curious too. It's a sulfite bridge. It's in Franklin. This was originally a railroad bridge. It looks like a covered bridge, but it's burned. It was arson of some sort. Um, but the, the railroad bridge, or the railroad tracks ran on top of it. Now there's a story here, I didn't bring it up because it really wasn't covered, but they had a, a concept where the Route 1 bridge is here and for a period of time where there was train tracks up above and cars below and people could walk. And it didn't last too long. I think a lot of people were like, you know, when that train starts going, it's like right above your head. It, it must have been a little, quite an experience, I have to think. Wow, uh, uh, Google is your friend. Right. I didn't know the Sawyer Pond Bridge on private property. That's just interesting. Interesting, huh? Yeah, we differentiate sometimes between historic bridges and private bridges, um, uh, especially because we find a lot of time private bridges are just a piece of steel or, um, uh, or a single span of wood. Um, they're not the true trust system. So we won't include those in our world guide. If they don't have a trust system, um, we will accept if they have both because we can't stop. We, we battle. It's one of our things as a society. We battle DOTs that want to just lift the bridge up, throw steel down, and pop the bridge back down on the steel. Um, we battle that because trust systems really do work. They come to us and say, well, we got to run a fire truck through and stuff. And, and we, we prove to them how much weight wood can hold. Wood is a quite an incredible material. Did it say like the date or anything? Or in the Google thing? No. So um, this is uh, Andover, New Hampshire, the Silly Bill Bridge. They almost always have a flag flying on it. And um, a Bradford, New Hampshire bridge. This is in East Hampton, Connecticut, Comstock, kind of famous one. Um, the next one is Whitneyville, Connecticut. I like the big sign there, 32 miles to Hartford, just in case you were. It, it, it tells us it goes way back to the kids saying, are we there yet? You know, which I'm going to give an aside because they're just one of my favorites. You probably, if you see my posting, I love seeing the mile markers that we have here. We have, we have five of them. They go, go from uh, Governor's Academy right here to um, near the Upper Green. In, in Newbury, although the, I'm worried about the one in the Upper Green because it feels like it's sinking. It's only sticking out about this high. <coughs> Most of the other ones are, you know, that high from the ground. But anyway, and I always like to joke about, you know, the kids. Kids have been asking for 300 years. Are we there yet? You know. Sorry, it's two more days till we get 35 miles to Boston. This is a popular one, West Cornwall, Connecticut. And I just want to give you a kind of a clear shot view of what a, the truss system can look like um, straight on through uh, this bridge. And um, this is actually up in Kentucky. It's a railroad bridge, so it was quite high. Um, and train a train would move through it. And these are just um, quickly to show you that there's multiple 
trust types. Timothy Palmer did copyright his or patent his trust design. Um, the most simplistic ones are the King Post Trust. You can see on the top, and then we have a Queen Post Trust, and then we have multiple King Post Trusts. Um, these are all examples of these different systems. A bird trust is pretty well known. That came out of New York State. Um, a town trust. These are all different designs that we look for. Long trusses, a how trust, and a paddle for trust. So that paddle for running in Groveton, New Hampshire, is the only one in the, the U.S., and we're desperately trying to save that one. This is the Bulls Bridge in uh, Kent, Connecticut. Difficult to get down to the spot that I'm in. Uh, this is up in Littleton, Maine, called the Watson Settlement Bridge. Now I want you to look closely at this one. There's something going on here. Can you sort of tell? It's a reflection. You're, you're absolutely right, Chris. It's a reflection, but it's been turned upside down. Meaning, imagine it rotated to be the other way. That's the view that you would normally have. So the little clues are, here's some of the, here's some of the, um, the support material. It's clear, you know, it's, that's in the view, um, being reflected then up. So that's just me and my uh, creative <laughs> attitude sometimes to uh, it's a Freiburg Bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. It's at the end of a, not the end of it, it's, it's a mile down a dirt road. I took my boss once down. It was wintertime. It was chic, you know, and um, no telephone poles, no wires. Um, if you went through it and then continued to be where the Fire, Freiburg Fair uh, grounds are, but um, and it views really nicely from all four corners. It's, it's one of my favorites. It's, Called the Hemlock Bridge, and it's it's isolated, but that's always part of the fun too. So you've gone to the Conway's North Conway or Conway, New Hampshire. There's several bridges right there. This one's just a, a really pristine one. It's not an active bridge. Um, it's got a, a rest area right there, and you can get out to look at it. It was one of those perfect, rare to find. Um, snowstorm happens, and the, the next day is a blue sky day. And that's like the for a photographer that's just perfection, you know, white snow, blue sky. And then you add in a red bridge and I was happy. Bath Village in New Hampshire's got quite a major one. It's built sort of on a dam area. It's had its residing done. Um, got a nice church in the background. It's a long bridge. And I have three here because I keep going back to this one for the different seasons. That's always another thing that you can do. Um, any kind of photographic thing is revisit. And this is on the Kankamangus Highway. It's almost at the, Con uh, the Conway end of the highway. Um, it's the Albany Bridge and nice fall scene there. And then we have a nice summertime scene. And then we have a winter scene. This is sunrise. You can see the sun is just starting to hit the top of the bridge and hitting the top of those uh, fir trees on the other side. And then I had to go to work. <laughs> this one is also one of my favorites. I've taken my kids here quite a number of times. You can actually kind of hop over a mills, mill run um, and, and you're on, I'm on a little island actually um, looking at the side of the Waterloo Bridge. Um, there was a, a train that didn't go through the bridge, but right on that, the train came up this way and it kind of went right down that way on the other side. Nice reflection there, too. Same bridge in the wintertime, also out on that island. This is a really well-recognized one. It's one of the few that has that um, quintessential scene with the church on the spire in the background. It's Arlington, Vermont. It's a little bit of a climb up to get to the position where I am. It's a little steep shale, um, rock, walk, you know, hike up a little bit. And just a few more. There's, uh, this is a rarity. It's twin bridges. They're in North Harland, Vermont. Um, you can see uh, 
Well, you can see the two of them. I'm out on the railroad bridge, um, uh, just a flat trestle bridge. You can see the other one kind of behind it right there. I remember being on, I'm, not, I'm one of those guys that when it's, you know, you've got to walk on the ties like in there. Just, <laughs> I just kept looking straight ahead. And I threw this one in here. It's wood, but it's the only uh, floating bridge east of the Mississippi River. Um, we had talked about earlier how um, not only at Cars Island and the ferrymen use a floating bridge, um, the, uh, the, this is the only one, well, it's the only one in Vermont. It's a real beautiful spot. Um, it actually floats. It's floating on the surface. Um, and then I, in reading a little deeper on it, it, it why did they do that? You know, the, the lake is too deep for traditional pilings. You couldn't build a piling system to connect. And, and it's too wide to do a single span. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's the seventh bridge. Um, there's eight total been built there. The new ones have fiberglass pontoons underneath them. Kind of went a little high tech to me, where this one was really just um, wooden, uh, wooden floats under it. It moves when you walk on yes. it, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's floating. And then the driver car crosses. <laughs> it's a little... And there's water on it, too. So there's, there's a couple inches of water that you're going through. I love Tunbridge area. I don't know if you've ever been up to Tunbridge on Vermont. Kind of in the, you ever hear the World's Fair? The Tunbridge, Tunbridge Fair. Fair. Yeah. Um, and you've been to the fair. I've been to the fair. Long time ago. Did you ever hear about Fred Tuttle? The, oh, um, my goodness. Oh, yes. yeah. He yeah. just um, had a post about it. The Man with the Plan, they call him. It. it was quite a series of films that came out. And then this is um, interesting. This is uh, Cornish Windsor. Um, it crosses over from... Uh, New Hampshire to Vermont or vice versa. It's the longest historic covered bridge in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I have to have that caveat there, in the U.S., because there's one up in Canada that's long. But that's Canada. Here in the U.S., this is the longest one. I have a friend who lives just up above this. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real beauty. And this one's probably, I think, the most handsome bridge. It's Ashwelot. Um, in New Hampshire, it's just it's open um, with the truss system exposed. It's painted to that beautiful white, nice red roof, sunny day, um, nice color reflection. I was thinking of the light in the water. And nearby in Campton, New Hampshire, is the Blair Bridge. I actually have two views of this. This one has suffered. Um, I can't tell you how many times. Um, trucks drive through without leaving the height warning. <laughs> and the poor, the, the builders had repaired this and then three weeks later, they put cameras in, three weeks later, you, I don't want to say, a truck goes through. And it's a real bane to us. There's a lovely restaurant right there too, if you're ever interested. It's a farm to table type restaurant. This is New Year's Day morning. The sun was coming up, and I was up in Jackson, New Hampshire. This is a Wentworth Bridge. Also in Jackson is the Honeymoon Bridge, and there's been a lot of weddings there, I have to think. Ooh. So we're just closing up here with... Um, this is, um, and I have materials if you're interested, you're free to take my business card from the society, the Covered Bridge Society. It's got all my contact information. You're free to take a brochure and you're free to join. We have, I, I sometimes, they don't want to reprint these brochures, but I keep telling them that $20 a year is about the cheapest <laughs> preservation society membership I know of. Um, we've been $20 a year for years. We do put out um, a quarterly historic information um, magazine, and we put out, at the same time, comes a, a, a kind of a, a newsletter with topics of things going on all around the country regarding um, covered bridges.
And so we do these safaris. We did one a few years ago up in Cornish area. And I, my buddy who lives up the way, his father likes to collect trucks and tractors. And I got him to bring this old Ford truck down. It was pretty cool. And then I just saw um, this again. We, we, um, we battle, um, we battle the sins of man, I'll say, the trucks driving through them. Um, but then there's the acts of God, which we don't really have, you know, there can be hurricanes come through, these big spring runoff freshets can lift bridges up. Um, this was in Queechee, I don't know if you've ever been to Queechee up near Woodstock, that, that bridge was heavily damaged um, by Hurricane Irene. Um, so, we as a society, we don't have the funds to like rebuild a bridge. It takes about two to three million dollars to build a bridge. Um, but we, we help guide towns to where they can get funding from the, the, their state governments and from their DOTs. We also help them to maybe prevent a DOT from just removing it and putting steel in place of it. Um, there's even funding in the last two years. Mm. And this is after, one of them in Kentucky was after, we have up in um, Swamp, Little Swamp, um, Arnold Graydon, he's 82 years old. Arnold is the second generation, his father, Milt, have built some of the most significant bridges in the last two generations and in and around New England and they go all over. Arnold is 82 years old. He's pretty crippled up. He's got, you know, um, sort of the canes around him. But he's still building, you know, he's out there building bridges at 82. In fact, I'm supposed to, I've been invited up, we're going to go, he built them one on Little Squam Lake. And his lovely wife, they want some photographs of it from out on the frozen lake. Kind of a, an unusual view to see the bridge from there. So the only thing we're waiting for is cold enough weather to freeze the lake. <laughs> so Arnold had gone down, they, they, they'd gone to Kentucky to rebuild a bridge. Um, it was a two-year job. They go down with a big RV. Um, they have about three other people working for that. <coughs> And they do this massive rebuild on it. And within one year, this is not the picture of it, but we lose them to arson. It's just, it's the saddest thing to us. Um, whatever is in somebody's mind to do that. Um, you can tell by here that they use accelerant, meaning probably just gasoline. Um, they use accelerant to that the bridge goes in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. By the time somebody sees it and the fire department gets there, and again, these are usually in rural places. So, it's still some of those, there's some bad people out there, but we do our best to um, to, to keep, keep them saved as best we can. And this should load. And again, this is... Um, some of the meetings we meet regularly at Kantukik up in that railroad bridge. Um, and these are our um, web Facebook page and our web address, our website, which will be on my business card there. Um, and we maintain that. These are the publications we put out four times a year. And we're also, we're, um, we, we, Produce the world guide. This lists every covered bridge in the world. Um, current ones, not the, not the current existing ones, although we have to modify it. You know, I, had, I just share one last closing story. We had, um, as a member, he passed away about 15 years ago now. Um, his name's Roger Easton. He's the father of GPS. The guy who designed it. And I love maps. I use I use the Delorme map system all the time. I love maps. I love paper maps. But, geez, you know, GPS has let me wander. It lets me, oh, I'll go down that way. You know, it'll still get me home. So I had lunch with him, and he was, it was like 1957. The Pentagon tasked the Air Force and the Navy to each come up with their own way to find a spot on the Earth. And, and not to work together, they each were to do it individually, and then the Pentagon picked his. 
and they threw up 13 satellites. They're about the size of basketballs, little spikes on them. 13 of them uh, gave global coverage. So I'm having lunch, and it kind of puts me on the spot. You know how it works? I'm like, I think it's triangulation, you know. And um, he said, you're right. At military level, it's even quadration. The fourth satellite will, three will get you to a spot on the Earth. Four would tell you if it's above the Earth. Maybe it's a story high or two stories high. So uh, to me, it was a real honor to, if you Google him, it's a fascinating story. He didn't make a nickel on it, because he was in the military. But I, I believe it was George W., it might have been his father. They did give him a Medal of Honor, though, for the significance of this technology that, I don't know about you, but I use it all the time. It's amazing. I don't know how I got to wherever I'm going before GPS, you know. There was that period where you could print, they printed out the directions for you. But before that, we had to use maps. Yeah, I, I could keep telling you stories, but. So I have two teen, I have two daughters, they're in their 30s. Back about five years ago, the one daughter's going off to Washington State. I give her my DeLorme map. And for kids, they're, they're used to the, you know, you're on the phone with it, but Google Maps is okay, but there's nothing like a, a big paper map where you know, you can see like where you are, not just focus on a small spot. Besides, the DeLorme system is just filled with historic information and all kinds of covered bridges even. They're, they're just marvelous maps. I love them. Unfortunately, they may disappear, but because their DeLorme facility, have you seen what was their headquarters? It was in Freeport, Maine, right on Route 1. It's a big building with all glass. It's got the world's largest globe in it. It's three stories high globe. It was built with satellite imagery. They said it was the largest file ever printed. It's sitting, it's cantilevered just right. It's rotating at the correct speed for its size. You can go up to three, two balconies. You can stare at it, knock out your peripheral vision, and you, you, you feel like you're in a space shuttle or something, just moving really slowly. You can even see roads on this. Well, anyway, they garment water. And they're, it's their research and development uh, facility now. Um, but anyway, that's. That's all I got, folks. Thank you. Thank you.